My name's Marie Asher. I'm the director of the library, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to what is our third annual Yom HaShoah event. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Yom HaShoah is also known as Holocaust and Heroism Remembrance Day, and it's been observed since 1951 to commemorate the nearly 6 million or approximately 6 million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, as well as to remember those who resisted the actions of the Nazis in Europe. Here at New York Medical College, as I said, this is our third annual observance of this important day. Last week in the New York Times, there was a report of results of a survey that was carried out by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims in Germany. These results showed that the Holocaust appears to be receding from memory in America. Findings such as 31% of Americans and 41% of millennials believe that fewer than 2 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. And 41% of Americans and 66% of millennials could not say what Auschwitz was. So whereas we say never forget, the details of the atrocities of the Holocaust are rapidly and tragically receding from public consciousness. And this is why we're here today. Because we as a community, as a university in the Jewish tradition, cannot and will not forget. We have a duty to those who both perished and resisted to remember, to recognize, and to educate. We have four speakers here today, and I'm going to introduce them one by one. First, here to light candles and say the Yom HaShoah prayer is Professor Ann Bayefsky, Director of the Toro Institute on Human Rights and the Holocaust. We light this yellow candle to rekindle God's flame, to shine his light upon the world once again, to sanctify the memories of the millions of souls, to honor their prayers and all their lost goals. We bless their existence by being alive, to light this yellow candle as proof we survived. On Yom HaShoah, or Yom HaShoah is a day, a time for us, to remember the victims of the greatest crime of man against man, the young, the old, the innocent, the million and a half starved, children shot, given lethal injections, gassed, burned, and turned to ash because they were deemed guilty of the crime of being different. We remember what happens when hate takes hold of the human heart and turns it to stone. What happens when victims cry for help and there is no one listening? What happens when humanity fails to recognize that those who are not in our image are nonetheless in God's image? We remember and pay tribute to the survivors who bore witness to what happened and to the victims so that robbed of their lives, they would not be robbed also of their deaths. We remember and give thanks for the righteous of the nations who saved lives, often at risk of their own, teaching us how in the darkest night we can light a candle of hope. Today on Yom HaShoah, we call on you, on Yom HaShoah and Yom HaShoah week, we call on you, Almighty God, to help us hear your voice that says in every generation, do not murder, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Do not oppress the stranger. We know that whilst we do not have the ability to change the past, we can change the future. We know that whilst we cannot bring back the dead to life, we can ensure their memories live on and their deaths were not in vain. And so you and I, students and teachers, us, 
We commit ourselves to one simple act. Yitzkor, remember, may the souls of the victims be bound in the bond of everlasting life. Amen. In 1996, the Health Sciences Library at New York Medical College and at medical libraries around the world, there was received a letter from the University of Vienna recording an item on our shelves, Edward Pernkoff's Topographic Human Anatomy in English, along with an enclosure describing newly discovered information about the origins and nature of this atlas with the intention of informing the user and allowing the user himself ethically whether and how he might consider to use this work. Our keynote speaker here today, Dr. Howard Israel, is an adjunct professor and course director for pain and anxiety control at Toro College of Dental Medicine at New York Medical College. There may be no one closer to the story of the revelation of the Pernkoff Atlas and its surrounding ethical debates. Dr. Israel. Thank you. Um, it, can you I'll just lower these lights? Just these lights. Okay. Oh, great. Well, So it's really an honor. I want to thank uh, thank you very much uh, um, to be present for this Yama Shoah presentation at New York Medical College and at uh, Toro's College of Dental Medicine as part of this uh, important Remembrance Day. There are a lot of people to thank, but there are a few people I just want to especially point out before I begin. Um, I want to thank. Uh, Maria Asher for helping coordinate this, um, our director of the Health Sciences Library. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chancellor Halperin for giving me this opportunity. Um, also, uh, Dean Emeritus of the Dental School. Jay Goldsmith, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Mindy in the back. Uh, Mindy um, has quietly uh, been behind the scenes on this journey uh, from 1973, and it continues to the present. And um, she's just been instrumental in everything that I do. So <sighs> let's talk about something that's impossible, something that's incredibly unbelievable, and yet it did happen. The medical profession, the dental profession, instead of healing people, committing murder and atrocities. How did this happen? I'm sure many of you have had relatives who, uh, unfortunately, were victims of genocide. I have to tell you, I'm very fortunate. I don't have anyone in my immediate family within the next generation, or one generation or two, that's been involved. So I feel fortunate in that regard. So let me tell the story of uh, Prunkoff's anatomy from my perspective. Um, as Marie had mentioned, this is an anatomy book that is considered a classic. It's been published in languages um, throughout the world, in medical school libraries throughout the world. And if you look at the various reviews of this anatomy book, you'll find that it is considered a masterpiece that will never, ever be reproduced. Um, as much, uh, it brings the anatomy as much to life on a page as any uh, book has ever existed because the artists were, were exquisitely talented um, uh, in the creation of this book. So my story goes back to, way back to 1973. I was a um, first-year dental student at Columbia University, 
And the first thing I was confronted with was eight weeks of anatomy. We took together with PNS. We had eight weeks to learn everything from head to toe, uh, not just the head and neck. And uh, our, our book was Grant's Atlas. Uh, I, I hope nobody here is a relative of Grant, but I, uh, when I looked at that book, to me, it reminded me of a comic book. I, so I went to my professors and I said, you know, I need something a little better than that because uh, I, I really, really want to know this stuff. And the professor says, oh, without question, Kernkoff's Anatomy. I looked it up and I found out that this book was beyond too expensive for a student. Now, in those days, it was $50. But we're talking 1973. In 1973, $50 for a student was equivalent to maybe four or $500 for a student today. However, I had mentioned this to my wife, Mindy. And Mindy, who had worked downtown, found the book and, as a gift, purchased this 1963 English language edition of Pernkoff's Anatomy. And I used this book to get through the course. I used it throughout dental school. I used it out through my, it out through my oral and maxillofacial surgery training. And once I became a faculty member at Columbia University responsible for teaching oral and maxillofacial surgeons complex operations, I needed to know that I could review the anatomy before every case. And I would take this book out, and I would look at it and review it. It was my regimen. So I used the book for 20 years, and quite truthfully and honestly, do, do I think I have benefited from the use of this book? Absolutely. One day I had the book open to this page. I was preparing for a case the following day, and um, a colleague of mine walks in, looks at what I'm doing, and says to me, uh, hey, Howard, what you doing there? Oh, I see uh, Pernkoff's anatomy. You know, I heard Pernkoff was a Nazi. So you have to understand, it, I never even thought of where this book came from, who Pernkoff was. I knew absolutely nothing. But when this was mentioned to me, it struck me to the core because this was my most used book. So being at Columbia, I went down to the library stacks. And there in the library stacks were the 1937, 43, and 52 editions of Pernkoff's Anatomy, and I opened up the books. They were written in German, and I looked very carefully, and I noticed that the artists signed their names with swastikas and SS symbols and other Nazi icons. And when I saw this, I, I, I really got crazy. I mean, how could it be that I was benefiting from a bunch of Nazis? Okay, it was, it was incredible to me. And then I started looking at my book, and lo and behold, there's my book, and I see the, the, the signatures, and you could see very carefully that the swastikas had been erased. So, and, and the same pictures, the same, same uh, depictions. And um, here's another uh, example of the same picture. And it wasn't just in Pernkoff's Anatomy. This is Clemente's Anatomy book. And on the top, you see Pernkoff's Anatomy. It's, um, uh, and you can see his signature, Lepier, with a swastika. And the picture in Clemente's Anatomy, um, in the English language edition, has the same picture, but the signature is cropped off so you cannot see that this was um, of Nazi origin. So I had all this information and all this uh, Jewish guilt or whatever guilt you want to call it, and I had to do something with it. It just disturbed me to the core. I started reading up on this, and this is a very interesting book, Nazi Doctors by Robert Lifton. He talks about doubling, how, how was it that a Nazi SS officer can murder people during the day um, uh, on the lines as a physician, and then go home and being the most loving and caring family person. And so he talks about doubling. I find out, after I've read the book, that uh, Robert Lifton is going to give the 1996 Yom HaShoah presentation at Columbia Presbyterian. Wow, what an opportunity for me. So I actually just 
picked up the phone. I called him up. I said, Dr. Lifton, I'm looking, for, uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. And by the way, how are you getting to the medical center? Oh, I'm taking the subway. I said, Dr. Lifton, can I, can I please give you a ride? And he says, why, sure. So I had the opportunity to meet him, drive him to the medical center. And of course, before the talk, I didn't mention anything about Pernikoff. I just wanted to have a nice, pleasant conversation. But after that conversation, I said, so I have this dilemma here. And he gave me a few names. He said, maybe you could speak to Michael Cater. Maybe you could speak to this one, that one. Well, it turns out that the person who really was a driving force in this was Bill Seidelman. Bill Seidelman, uh, at the time, was professor of uh, medicine at University of Toronto. And he had authored many papers on Nazi medicine in the Third Reich. And um, he and I became email friends. I, didn't have, I never met him, but back and forth, we emailed. And uh, a strategy was developed. And the first strategy was to write letters to the University of Vienna uh, School of Medicine and ask the anatomist, so what's the deal here? And the responses we got, we knew nothing, we did it in those days, and et cetera, et cetera. We asked the publisher, uh, Urban and Schwartzberg, and they said, don't worry, there were no concentration camp victims. I found it a bit disturbing since my name is Israel and Seidelman's name, you know, oh, it's okay as long as they weren't Jewish concentration camp victims. That was very disturbing. So I had additional collaborations, though. Um, Kurt Kelman, uh, a member of my temple, uh, had been in Vienna up until 1938. And he knew about these things, very bright man. And any time I would get a German um, a document, he would sit with me and translate. And the most important document that I had was I was able to get Pernkoff's dossier from the Berlin Document Center. So what did we find out? Who is Edward Pernkoff? Who was Pernkoff? I mean, I'd used the name so many times, I guess I should know who the heck he was. Well, it turns out that Edward Pernkoff was a Nazi. He was the uh, director of the Anatomy Institute from 1933 to 1938 at the University of Vienna Institute of um, Anatomy. And when Hitler took over Austria, he uh, named Parnikoff the dean of the medical school. The dean of the medical school. And as soon as he was named dean, there was a purge. All Jewish faculty, all Nazi dissenters, they were purged from the faculty. This is a picture of Edward Pernkoff, and this is his first address to his faculty. Now, I warn you, this really happened. What did he say? Well, I can't put it any better than quoting him. The purpose of this faculty is, quote, to assume the medical care with all your professional skill of the body of the people which has been entrusted in you not only in a positive sense of furthering the propagation of the fit, but also in a negative sense of eliminating the unfit and defective. The methods by which racial hygiene proceeds are well known to you, control of marriage, propagation of the genetically fit whose genetic biologic constitution promises healthy descendants, discouragement of breeding by individuals who do not belong together properly, whose races clash, and finally, the exclusion of the genetically inferior from future generations by sterilization and other means. Could you imagine a dean of a medical school in his first address? Here is a profession, a medical profession, that became the pseudoscientific rationale for Nazi doctrine. Now, there was, uh, around this time as we were exploring this, a CNN news magazine uh, called uh, CNN Impact. And I'm just going to just show you a few excerpts of this because it kind of gives you a little insight. And the Allies captured Austria. And Pernikoff spent two years at a camp that deprogrammed Nazis. Pernikoff later went back to the University of Vienna 
and worked on the book until he died in 1955. And after 20 years, I had no idea. I had no idea about this person. And it made me feel uh, betrayed, very angry. So angry, he wrote the prestigious journal of the American Medical Association and demanded the University of Vienna investigate to come clean about the book's past. And who now holds Perkoff's old job as head of the university. Professor Alfred Ebenbauer, a medieval literature scholar with a passion for human rights. Of course, we have to be ashamed that the university played a very bad role during the Nazi time. Ebenbauer launched an investigation. One of the first things he learned, that during the war, the bodies of political prisoners executed in a Gestapo-run court in Vienna actually did wind up at the university's anatomy institute. That's where Perkoff did his work. We know that there was an order that all executed persons from the, the court in Vienna who, who should be brought there. The Nazi court, called the Landesgericht in German, was so notorious, this monument in Vienna put its name right up there with infamous concentration camps like Bergen-Belsen. <laughs> the court dispatched political prisoners as well as common criminals. There was no mercy. Justice was the guillotine. The executed persons uh, they have been Jews, not Jews, a lot of victims, and uh, I am a little bit uh, hesitating whether we should uh, make a difference uh, in this context. Well, they were all victims of Nazi yeah. Yeah. Of course. Impact yeah. uncovered these drawings from 1943, showing what happened. And the urging of Perkoff, the court sent the bodies of those executed to the basement of the nearby Anatomy Institute. They arrived in simple wooden coffins. The corpses were cleaned, stacked like so many cords of wool, then tossed into a large vat of formaldehyde. No one disputes medical students use Nazi victims to study anatomy. But here's the question. Did Nazi artists use the victims' bodies to create the textbook? To help unlock the mystery of the Pernkopf Atlas, we came to this man, Professor Werner Plutzer of Innsbruck University. A world famous anatomist, he's also the editor of the Bernkopf Atlas. He was a Nazi. Yes, absolutely correct. As a young student after the war, Plotter worked with Bernkopf and his artists and proudly displayed dissections he did that were later drawn in the book. We wanted to know if these could have come from wartime victims of the Nazis. Was there never a question about this? Now I can't uh, accept what I can't say. So this could be a victim of Nazi terror. You just don't know. I don't know. What about this one? It's the same. While Plotter went out of his way to argue there were no Jewish victims in the book, that's a matter still under investigation. But he wasn't bothered that other Nazi victims may have been models for the artists. After all, he says, anatomy students in Vienna had been learning medicine thanks to the bodies of executed prisoners for more than 300 years. That's how the courts directed the bodies be used. It was the law. So killing the Austrian resistance fighters and using their bodies doesn't count as Nazi terror. At this time, it was the law. The Perkoff Atlas is a medical mystery that may never be solved here in Vienna. And that still leaves doctors struggling with a moral dilemma about a book with a Nazi past, whether or not to even use the tainted masterpiece in the name of medicine. Since I have found out that this book does have Nazi origins, I have not used the book. Would you use the book? To save lives, because I am a doctor. I must save lives under all circumstances. I must save lives. A question of medicine over morality. No, it is. The highest, and because we've sworn that we always are for life. Might not be enough. Under consideration by the American Medical Association, a motion that could effectively ban the book in American medical schools. Would it be a really good, maybe, to uh, uh, would use the phrase to burn the book? I don't know. From my point of view, burning books is a very, very problematic thing. Now, this is in terms of a trap.
For Howard Israel, the idea of banning the book is unsettling, but seeking the truth has become his quest. Now, as he digs deeper and deeper into the horrors of Nazi medicine, he keeps coming back to the same question. Should he use the truth of evil to save lives? There are times where I say to myself, well, if I had to operate on my uh, son tomorrow, if I needed the knowledge that I could gain from this book, would I use it? And maybe the answer is yes. So, at that time, the heart of this controversy really was, were those Nazi victims? And were their specimens still being used for teaching purposes in Austria? I just want to bring the point out that this took place at the University of Vienna, but Dr. Plotzer in that interview was at the University of Innsbruck and had taken some of his specimens over there. So here's a summary of what we knew. We knew that artists were Nazis, they used Nazi icons, that the illustrations in the subsequent English language editions had the icons eliminated. The victims were most likely from the Werner Landeskredit, and that there were anatomic specimens that still existed from Vienna and Innsbruck, but the exact names and the cause of, the, of death of those subjects were unknown. So we protested, Dr. Seidelman and I wrote to the JAMA, and it's, I think, interesting how this all turned out because the, out because the following day, um, the New York Times uh, science section picked it up, and I think this is what put the fuel on the fire um, when this uh, came out. Um, Yad Vashem became our official organization to request the investigation. We requested a public commemoration and an acknowledgement in every edition so that the unsuspecting user would at least know from where this came. And finally, Professor Ebenbauer, the director of the university, uh, launched an investigation. And he not only launched an investigation, but included the acknowledgement letter to all medical center libraries throughout the world, which uh, Marie has shared with us. And there's a, um, um, there, there's a copy of that in the uh, Health Sciences Library exhibit today. So the conclusions of the University of Vienna's investigation is that they received 1,377 bodies of people executed by the Nazis from 1938 to 45. Uh, they know about half of these were crimes of resistance and disobedience towards the Nazi regime. And the exact names and cause of death, we are told, could not be determined on an individual basis because they, quote, had destruction of these records from a 1945 air raid but it was very probable that the illustrations were indeed based upon victims of the Nazis. And in fact, in March of 2002, the University of Vienna held a uh, commemorative ceremony in which they took every specimen possible that could be of um, suspected Nazi victims from the Anatomy Institute and buried these specimens in a dignified grave of honor. Now that's what happened in the University of Vienna. Uh, it did not happen at the University uh, of Innsbruck. And as of today, as far as I know, those specimens still exist there. So that brings us now to 2005. So 2005, I was fortunate enough to be invited to give a talk on the Pernkoff book at the International Conference of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons. And guess what? The conference was in Vienna. I had never been in Vienna before. Now, what happened there is mind boggling, at least to me. So let me describe my experiences in Vienna. So this is the Hopburg Palace. And, you know, in the United States, you have a conference, you know, it's usually in a Marriott and a Hilton, but in Vienna, you have your conference in a palace. 
quite an amazing uh, place here. This is looking outside the Hofburg Palace onto the lawn. This is the Hofburg Palace. Uh, portions of it were built in the 1600s. Architecture is beautiful. And I show this picture for one reason, one reason only. I knew nobody there. And being a little introverted and not speaking German or, or a foreign language, I decided in my spare time, I would just jog the city. So I jogged Vienna. And what I had was, what I found when I was jogging Vienna, like I'd come across couples that were touring and they, they'd go, hey, could you take a picture? So I would be taking pictures of, of these people you know, couples that were going to do one. Well. And I said, you know, one time I said, take a picture of me. So I had that. That's the one picture in back of the Hofburg Palace in my middle of one of my jogs. My jogs were quite random. I had no idea where I was going. I only knew where the hotel was. Here's the city hall. Here's just a quaint little street. There is the uh, Vienna Museum of Natural History, which we will get back to in a few moments. There's the opera house. And then one day, uh, one jog, I found myself right in front of the University of Vienna School of Medicine. So I walk in, and I look at the little map on the wall, which shows where biochemistry is, this room, and, that, and then I see synagogue. I'm saying to myself, synagogue in the University of Vienna School of Medicine? What is a synagogue doing there? So I jogged over to there, and this is what I found. What this was, was a memorial, which had just been completed. And it was a memorial because this was a prayer room, a Jewish prayer room, before 1938. And people who were Jewish, who had a family in the hospital, would go to the prayer room and give their prayers. Well, this was a commemorative uh, recreation of that, and written on the sidewalk in front of this prayer room were in three languages, English, German, and Hebrew. Uh, it says, in commemoration of the victims of Nazis at the hands of the Austrians. I said, wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that they would have this kind of commemoration. Now, I want you to picture the scenario. I'm standing here. The memorial is just to my right. I look just to my left, and there is the building for oral and maxillofacial surgery. I thought that was a little strange, a little weird. Here I was, an oral surgeon in a strange land, and I was standing right in between the memorial and the oral surgery building. So I continue on my random jog, and I notice this big, huge building. It was kind of impressive. It looked like a fortress, and I looked up close, and guess what this was? The Wiener Landeskredit. This is where they guillotined people in the basement for being uh, a diso disobedient to the Nazi cause. Two blocks away. Again, no planned jog here. I find myself at the in, in front of the Anatomy Institute. This is where Pernkoff did his work. I walked in. I just opened up the door, and I walked in. There's a... Uh, statue. I'm not sure whether it's Hippocrates, but I really am trying to find out what, what statue was in the lobby there. And this is the back of the Anatomy Institute, which I found quite symbolic. Two blocks away, same jog, is a bookstore, Urban and Schwartzberg. Urban and Schwartzberg is the publisher. So I'm saying, what is, you know, two blocks away? So I'm thinking to myself, so in 1938, you were disobedient, you would wind up in the Wiener uh, Landeskredit, you'd get your head chopped off, you'd then be sent to the Anatomy Institute, have your body dissected and, and drawn, and then you would appear in a book, all within four or five square blocks. I mean, just the thought of what was happening within a few square blocks, to me, in, in, at that time, was just mind-boggling. I walked into the bookstore just to see if they were selling Pernkoff's Anatomy, and they weren't, but they had an antique book collection. And there on the shelf was Pernkoff's Anatomy. The next day, I continue on my jog, and lo and behold, I find myself in front of a synagogue. 
Now, most of you probably know that once the Nazis took over in 1938, they burnt every synagogue. So there were no synagogues left except this one. The story behind this is quite interesting. If you walk into this synagogue, they have a, um, a guide give you a tour of the history of, of Jews in Austria. And it turns out in the 1820s, 1830s, Jews were not accepted. And if you want to build a synagogue, you couldn't have a freestanding building. You had to build it somewhere hidden. So this synagogue was built around 1820, 1830, inside an apartment complex, not freestanding. However, following that time in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, Jews were more accepted. 30, 40 opulent synagogues, Jews flourished in Vienna. But then 1938 occurred, and all of those synagogues were burned down except this one. Why? Because it was built in a complex of apartment buildings. And the thing that repressed, that caused the, this building to be repressed in the 1820s is what enabled it to survive the Nazis, the only one. I, so I walked inside, and it was newly restored, and I later found out that my dear friend Kurt Kelman, who was a member of my temple, had his bar mitzvah in this synagogue, which was kind of an interesting coincidence in itself. So I'm sitting in the, in the auditorium in, in the sanctuary listening to the tour guide. And when the tour guide is through with his talk, I decide I'm going to look around. And there were memorial plaques 360 degrees around this synagogue. And my eyes, for whatever reason, only went to one memorial plaque. And I just walked up. I just wanted to just see who it was. And there's my name. Chaim ben Israel. So I was getting kind of, you know, uh, very strange thoughts uh, were occurring to me that this was this strange. Here is the Judenplatzen. This is the Jewish Museum. And lo and behold, there was a brand new Jewish memorial um, right in the middle of the square, which had the concentration camps at its base. And right opposite that was this um, sign. Uh, which really basically was saying, we're, we're sorry. The, the, the uh, Catholics of, of Austria are sorry for what we did to the Jews. This is a statue commemorating Jewish victims. This statue had been uh, where the Gestapo had been in Vienna. And this monument against war and fascism in the middle of Vienna is quite interesting. It really is, if you look at it carefully, very heart-wrenching. And behind that is the statue of um, a um, person uh, who is scrubbing the streets clean. Um, and I'm going to get back to this as well. And then I further jog forward, and there I see Nazis in, and it says, the Nazis rouse, Nazis get out. So after all these crazy coincidences occurred to me, which was out of body experience, I, I thought I needed to see someone about my psychiatric health. So I walked into, there's a Professor Freud a few blocks away. And uh, his office was empty. I guess, <laughs> I, I guess he didn't take insurance. I don't know. So let's look at the timeline. The discovery of Pernkoff's book, the JAMA New York Times article, the Vienna press release, 1998. And Following this, there were a tremendous number of articles written about Pernkoff and Pernkoff's anatomy and the, 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 the bioethical dilemma. One of the key people, uh, Sabine Hillebrand, to this day is writing about all of the terrible things about Nazi medicine. You know, you know you've heard of Mengele, but what about some of the other ones who flourished? Here, I told you to remember the Vienna Museum of Natural History. Professor Hermann Voss was the director of the Anatomy Institute in Poland. He used executed subjects for teaching purposes and, prepare, and prepared plaster of Paris uh, death masks. And he really he sold these death masks to the museum so that they could be used for a, an exhibit for a race that had become extinct. This is what it looks like in 1939. Eventually, the skulls were buried in a Jewish cemetery. But Professor Voss was an acclaimed academic. 
uh, and had been honored as an outstanding people scientist in East Germany for his contributions and lived well after the war. Heinrich Gross. Heinrich Gross was a, uh, Gross was a veteran Nazi who was a member of Hitler Luth, and he was a psy psychiatrist, and he was responsible for the death of many children who had, um, had psychiatric pro problems, um, and they were handicapped children put to death uh, because they needed to purify the Aryan race. After World War II, he continued to experiment on the preserved brains of these murdered children, and he published many articles between 1955 and 1965 and became one of the most decorated uh, neuropsychologists in, Aust in Austria and was awarded the cross uh, for, scientific, uh, for science and art in 1975. However, after the Perkoff controversy, he was put on trial for complicity for the murder of these handicapped children. And um, unfortunately, the judge suspended the trial because he was senile and deemed unfit. He was striped, uh, stripped of his medal and died at the ripe old age of 90. Herman Steve, just a few. Um, his claim to fame was research on, um, on women, on the reproductive org uh, organs of women and, he, and the effects of stress on these reproductive or organs. And his methodology was quite simple. He worked on these women who were in Nazi prisons, and their stress level was being told that they were going to be executed. And after that, they were executed. The um, female organs were uh, dissected out, and he wrote many papers, published. He became the dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Humboldt University in East uh, Berlin. And there's a lecture room honoring this scientist of Nazis. And finally, August Hurt was a professor of anatomy at University of Strasbourg who used uh, Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz prisoners for his skeleton and skull collection. Um, and he wanted to sell those skulls and, uh, to uh, enhance his mail order business to increase his income. He was uh, found out, committed suicide in 1945. And we think about these terrible people, but um, I'd like to show the slide of the victims of August Hurt, and there was a commemorative ceremony um, um, honoring Hurt's victims in 2005. So what do we do? What do we do about victims? Uh, what do you do about Pernkoff's anatomy? Now, some people say, look, it happened, and we could use it as an educational tool. And some people say, we recommend its continued use honoring the victims. This issue continues to this very day. And I am constantly getting emails and um, up-to-date information about this. Um, I became aware, let me back up a little bit. I became aware of, let me back this up, sorry. of Susan McKinnon. Susan McKinnon is the chief of uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She is one of the most well-known uh, clinicians, scientists in nerve transplants, in nerve grafting procedures. And it turns out Susan McKinnon has been using this book in her operating room since the 1980s. And she knew about Pernicost background, but has also valued it as a teaching tool. And she's raised the question, should you or should not use the book? And she recently, she and Andrew Yi, um, published a paper which was a survey on the opinions of surgeons on whether or not you should and could use the book. This information then was fed to a retreat, to a symposium at Yad Vashem about how do you deal with Holocaust era remains? And one thing led to the other, and it led to what is called the Vienna Protocol, when Jewish or possibly Jewish human remains are discovered. And they went to Rabbi Pollock, 
who's the Chief Justice of the Rabbinical Court of New England, collaborating with uh, Michael Groden from um, Harvard, uh, uh, excuse me, from Boston University, the Elie Wiesel Center of Jewish Studies. And I urge you to look up the Vienna Protocol. This is basically a rabbinical responsum uh, on what you do about this issue. So that leads me to the final piece of where this continues to this day with me. About three years ago, I received an email that there was um, a paper that they wanted me to review about Nazi dentists. Now, you've heard of Mengele, we've heard of Nazi medicine, but what about Nazi dentists? So I read this paper by uh, Professor Riyadh, and um, as a reviewer, I would never have accepted this paper. I guess I shouldn't say that, but it was just too disorganized, but the content was incredible. So we reorganized it, and instead it did get published, and it became an area of fascination for me. And I won't go into this, but one part I'm going to tell you is that gold became the fuel for the Nazi machine. You know, it was the uh, gold was was uh, no, none of the other countries wanted to deal with uh, Germany, but they had a deal with the Swiss. And gold was uh, the Swiss francs that the Germans had with the Swiss to enable Germany to build up their arm and armies. And gold was so precious, and that's the reason why the first thing that the Nazis would do when they invaded a country would go to the central bank and get the bullions of gold from central bank. But there was gold from another source, gold from humans. And here is a PhD thesis by a Victor Schultz, which he defended successfully in 1940 about dental gold. And it is vital for the economy of the Third Reich. And in the end of his thesis, this is not an end in itself, rather a beginning. Now, this talk about dental gold, the Nazi dentist, is a subject for another presentation, which we will eventually, I'm sure, share with the dental students and anybody else who's interested. So I'm going to end with going back to this statue. This is the statue for war and fascism at, uh, in Austria. And about four weeks ago, I get an email from a woman who is the granddaughter of a physician, of a physician who went to the uh, University of Vienna School of Medicine and was, you know, had a, uh, you know, had a, had a leave. Um, and she said, you know, Dr. Isra, have you heard of this book written by um, G.E.R. Gedje? The, um, um, and he wrote this book, The uh, Fallen Bastions, and he was a British journalist who was there in Vienna from 1925 to 1938. And he was witness to what was going on in Vienna. And in 1938, he was uh, expelled by the Germans. He was lucky he wasn't killed. But he wanted to write down what he saw in Vienna. And I'm going to just read one line or one paragraph from this, and I'll end on that. This is the statue, and this is the picture of the man scrubbing the, the streets of Vienna. And this is what he wrote in 1939. It is not so much all of the brutalities of the Austrian Nazis, which I have witnessed or verified direct from the victims, which blurs the image of Vienna I thought I knew, it is the heartless grinning of soberly dressed crowds of the people, of the little man in Austria, the fluffy Viennese blondes, fighting one another to get closer to the elevating spectacle of an ashen-faced Jewish surgeon on hands and knees before half a dozen young hooligans with swastika armlets and dog whips. That sticks in my mind. His delicate fingers, which must have made the swift and confident incisions that had saved the lives of many Viennese, held a scrubbing brush. A stormtrooper was pouring some acid solution over the brush and his fingers. Another sluiced the pavement with a bucket, taking care 
to, to drench the surgeon's striped trousers as he did so. And the Viennese, not uniform Nazis or a raging mob, but the little Viennese man and his wife just grinned approval at the glorious fun. Thank you. We have time for questions. So there's microphones, um, or if anyone wants to ask a question, I can deliver a microphone to you. Any questions? Passing that down. Thank you. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, catch this during the presentation, but to, you still use the Perkinoff. Okay. Right? <laughs> I was going to, if nobody had a question, I was going to say, do you still using the book? And I was going to answer that question. Well, firstly, my opinion is. It's up to the individual to make their own decision as to whether or not they should or should not use the book. But it has to be with the knowledge and the memory of how it was created. Now, you asked me if I use the book. Now, you probably saw that in 1998, I said I haven't used the book. So from 1998 up until the present, what I did was I took the drawings. And I would sketch from those drawings my own little anatomic map. And every time I needed to go to do a case, I wouldn't open up the book, but I'd open up my sketch drawings, knowing that I wasn't looking directly at it, but I was looking indirectly at it. I don't know whether that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but I kind of in my mind felt that was a, a compromise for me. Dr. Amar. Could you expand on the joke? And I was in Strasbourg when we started discussing all this. On the final recommendation uh, regarding what everybody is waiting to see whether we can use the data. Well, I know in Strasbourg we had the samples uh, on display. I, I, I deliberately kind of didn't expand on it because it would be my interpretation of his response. However, I urge you to read his, his Vienna Protocol. I have a copy of it, and it's also online. It reviews what, what the rabbis say about Jewish remains, how important it is to have dignity, how important it is not to abuse remains, not to profit from remains, et cetera, to bury the remains as quickly as possible. However, he does mention in that Vienna Protocol an anatomy atlas, the Vienna Protocol, and he says that maybe uh, from the concept of saving a life, that maybe it's okay to, if you're going to save a life and use data that's tainted, as long as you know it's tainted, that it might be okay. But again, I prefer not to I prefer you all to read it, and I'm happy to send you a link to that, uh, anybody who's interested. It is ambiguous, because on one hand, it says one thing, and on the other hand, it says, but maybe we can give you an out if you're going to save a life. So it's a tough one. Thank you, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Can you? Give us your opinion about the conversations of some scholarly societies that we should unname diseases or entities such as Van Hollard and Spates disease or Asperger's syndrome because these neuroscientists similarly use victims of concentration camps or criminal courts to do their research and were honored by having diseases and entities named after them. Okay. Um, I, I believe that any person who was an unethical and committed crimes of this nature should not be honored 
like many of the people that I had mentioned. Uh, so I don't think there's any honor in having a name of a Nazi or someone who committed unethical acts that go totally against what healthcare is about, to have a disease named for them or to have a statue named for them or have a bust or, a, or a, an honorary degree, which happened to many of these Nazis after the war. So I would, not be, I would be in favor of changing the name. It doesn't change the disease, but I don't think a person should be honored for it. If I can just mention one a related issue. In, I was in Vienna for the first and only time in 1993 at the UN World Conference on Human Rights. It's only the second World Conference on Human Rights in history, and there has never been one since. And walking through those streets in Vienna um, uh, reminded me of the penultimate night that went on till four o'clock in the morning of the entire world, all world states were in one room, and I was um, with the Canadians so I could see the internal workings that wasn't open to the public. And the suggestion was in this hundred paragraph document, many dozens and dozens of pages listing all the human rights violations in the world today um, to put the word anti-Semitism into the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights. And it was rejected. And so the, what you may not know, but you may have heard of in another context, the famous Vienna Declaration of Human Rights does not mention anti-Semitism as a human rights violation. So this isn't just, um, you know, something from the past. It's very much part of our future and current situation. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thirl. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up to the podium Dr. Matthew Pravitz, Professor of Cell Biology and Anatomy, Program Director, Anatomy Course Director, and Assistant Dean for Basic Sciences for some comments. Just a couple words. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> From the beginning of the debate, the debate that, that we're talking about this afternoon, uh, there have existed two opposed views, and we've heard them. And there are two opposed views about the continuing uh, to use the, uh, the Pernkoff anatomical atlas. On one side, there are those people, as you've heard, who would like to see the atlas removed from libraries. These people perceive that there is a fundamental evil, an evil in the very act of perhaps just creating the atlas. On the other hand, there are those who champion continued use of the atlas, and they proffer that there may be some good derived, even if it's good derived from evil, they say. They say that the book provides new doctors with means maybe to perform better operations, perhaps. They may even go so far as to suggest that we should not eliminate books such as this, since the very suppression of books, any books that is, is a symptom of total totalitarian systems, systems of government or academe. When looking at all of this in a balance, I think to either see the atlas as a master work of great aesthetic value or the evil manifestation of science, a science only capable of being performed by Nazis. Either way, 
it seems to ascribe, I think, too much power and too much power to a book. The atlas is neither a work of a supernatural beauty nor of supernatural evil. It's a product of an all too human mind of an obsessive perfectionist who would have pursued his work under any political conditions and circumstances, I think. A ban could not atone for the great evil, the evil which was committed by human beings on another human being. It's up to a new human generation to glean a lesson from this murky history. The Pernkoff paintings can serve a double role, if we think about it. More than just teaching anatomy, they may also remind us of the horror, the horror that any objective science can impose. Objective science. The lessons to be learned from Pernkoff's methods include not only the need for careful scrutiny of relations, relations between academic institutions and the government in general, but more specifically, the need for closer examination of the sources of body acquisition in modern anatomy. The Pernkoff story is, a story is a lesson. It's a lesson in modern anatomy in that the inquiry into the sources of human bodies can not be too careful. Rigorous standards have to be formulated and rigorous standards must be followed. Thank you. Okay, and finally, I'd like to call up to the podium uh, Rabbi Moshe Krupka, Executive Vice, Vice President of Torah College, for closing remarks and a closing prayer. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we began by an explanation that today commemorates Yom HaShoah HaGvura, a day of remembrance for the martyrs of the Holocaust, for the heroism of that period of time. It's always a pleasure and an honor to follow my friend and distinguished colleague, Dr. Pravitz. And Dr. Israel, I wish I could go to dental school to hear your lectures because it was riveting. And, and we thank you for what you've had us all think about during your presentation. So there's, uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't know of any other health science campus that today, in 2018, holds a commemoration for Yom HaShoah. Some of the statistics that Marie offered at the beginning were sobering about how forgotten history could be. And there's a certain rhythm to a Yom HaShoah commemoration. There's a speaker. There's a candle, and there's a rabbi usually who will offer a memorial prayer. But I think that the motivation for this commemoration on this campus, 
with all of you, students, staff, faculty, engaged in healing God's creation in the health sciences. I think there's something that we can take as we leave this auditorium. And I'd like to share a story with you, a very brief one. I'm very cognizant of the time. It's actually a true story. The story took place but 25 minutes drive from this campus. It's a story that my son, who returned to Jerusalem to study in yeshiva, told us um, at our Seder table this past Passover. And I was very moved by the story. And uh, Dr. Israel, I thought of you during your presentation. I thought of this story. And I'll tell you why. You know that during Passover, one of the staples of, of the eight-day holiday is matzah. Matzah's unleavened bread. It consists of only flour and water. And according to Jewish law, you have to mix the dough and bake the matzah within 18 minutes in order for it to qualify as kosher for Passover. Some of you may know that there are very varying sects of Orthodox Jews. Uh, there is a sect of Jews called Hasidim, or ultra-Orthodox individuals. These are the people that you will encounter that will wear long black caftans and on the Sabbath wear round circular fur hats. And their service and their devotion within Judaism centers around the grand rabbi who's at the center of their community. And together, as he leads and they follow, they live up to an ideal of service to the Almighty. And one of the practices within Hasidic Judaism is to make very special matzos on the eve of Passover. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to a matzah bakery where they do everything by hand. I've heard it referred to as a hoot, um, but it's an experience. And all of the Hasidim, all of the followers, each had a job to do within the factory on the afternoon, on the eve of Passover, there was someone who would pour the flour and another person who would pour the water and there were others that were kneading the dough and there were those that were rolling out the matzahs and there were those that were perforating them. But the most intricate, most specialized job in the process is the job of the sheber. In Yiddish, the Sheber is the baker. And our story this evening refers to the Sheber on the eve of Passover for decades in the community of New Square, which is right over the Tappan Zee Bridge. The Sheber was a fellow by the name of Shia Unger. Shia Unger was a tall man, I've met him, lanky, quiet but affable, and he served as the gabai, the assistant to the grand rabbi. And he would stand at the furnace door, and as the matzahs were completed, he would put them into the oven, and within seconds, he would flip the, uh, the pole, that were inserting the matzahs and turn them over, extract them before they would burn. And that was his job year in, year out, until his death in 2015. He was 90 years old when he passed on. And when he was in his 80s and he no longer could function with agility, they said, 
Rabshaya. You're older now. Pass it on to the next generation. And he refused. So for the last few Passover Eves, he wasn't the actual baker, but he stood next to the baker and inspected every single matzah that came out of this fiery furnace. And someone in that last Passover, when he was leaning on a stick, looking at the matzahs, finally had the chutzpah, the audacity, to say, Reb Shaya, why? Why is it so important for you to be standing at this furnace, extracting, inserting, and extracting these matzahs? You would leave it to no other. Tell us, what's the significance? And he would be doing this with a seriousness and with a, a concentration and a focus that was just so intense. So Shaya turned to the questionnaire and he said the following, that I want to tell you how I survived World War II. Jews would come on a transport. And there was a selection on a platform, and by the flick of a thumb, you were sent to the gas chambers to your death, and a few to the showers, the slave labor. And those that went into the gas chambers, 1,500 at a clip, were stuffed into this room, naked, embarrassed, petrified, and within 25 minutes, the Tziklan B would extinguish their lives. And then on the other end of the gas chamber, the door would be opened and the bodies would fall out. And then Shia Unger, and a few other unfortunate souls lifted those bodies onto flatbed wagons. And my job, day in and day out, was to take those bodies, people who I knew, people who were related to me, and deposit those bodies into the ovens to destroy the evidence of the murder. And you ask me, why do I stand here baking these matzahs? Because when I take those matzahs out, I don't see matzah, I see faces. I see the faces of victims, but more importantly, I see the faces of my children, my grandchildren, and future generations that survived and are now living a life as Jews and as free people. Yes, we're here to commemorate martyrs. In Judaism, those that perished, there was a sign on one of the monuments in Vienna on Kiddush Hashem. In Judaism, to be martyred, Al Kiddush Hashem to sanctify God's name. It's a very high level of service. But, ladies and gentlemen, I will submit to you there's one level higher than dying, Al Kiddush Hashem, dying in the sanctification of God's name. It's living to sanctify God's name. And I submit to you, young students, members of the staff, members of the esteemed faculty and the administration. When we leave this auditorium, we will leave with a bit of sensitivity for human dignity, for compassion, for making this world a little bit better today than it was yesterday.
Dr. Israel, when you look at your sketches, you're not looking at sketches. You're looking at people. Our eyes should be focused in remembering those who were killed. But more importantly, taking that memory and looking forward to make this world a better place. Will you please stand and join with me in a prayer for those who were killed during the Holocaust. I'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then repeat it in English. As I've always said on these occasions, today's the day to remember people who have endured persecution. It would probably, no, I'm confident it would be an honor to have you all think of those people whom you've encountered who would be appropriate to be remembered on a day such as this. El Mali Rachamim, Shochein Bambromim, Amsei Menucho Nechono Al Kanfe Yashchino, Bimalos Kedoshim Tahorim Kizoro Rokia Mazhirim, Es Nishmos Hakidoshim Vatahorim, Shehom Suvishanergu, Vishanishatu Vinish Vishanisrafu, Vishanitbu Vishanechniku, Al Kidush Hashem, Al Yudei Hatsorim Hanatsim Vosrehem, Yemach Shemam Vizichram. Bavur Shablina de Tin Stoch Vyaraskos, Nishme Sehem, Vigan Eden Teheim Nuchosom, Lachain Balarach, Mim Yasti Rain Vesaknof of Leo Lomim. Yitzror bitzror achayim es nishmoi sehem Adoi noi hu nach alosom Yenuch v'shal meshkavoi sehem v'neimar amen O God full of mercy who dwells on high Grant proper rest on the wings of the divine presence In the lofty levels of the holy and the pure ones To the souls of the holy and pure ones who were killed Murdered slaughtered, burned, drowned, and strangled in the sanctification of your name through the hands of the Nazis and their collaborators. May their name and memory be obliterated. Because we, here on this campus engaged in health sciences, will engage in acts of charity and kindness in remembrance of these souls. May their resting place be in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, may the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity. May he bind their souls in the bond of life. The Almighty is their heritage. And may they repose in peace on their resting places. And let us say, Amen. Thank you all, all of you, for attending and participating in this very meaningful program.